All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by John Meese, who is in Columbia, Tennessee, not far from Nashville. How are you doing, John? I'm doing really well, John. How are you? Good, good, good. And John is a serial entrepreneur and uh, on a mission to eradicate generational poverty by equipping entrepreneurs with the tools and training they need to uh, succeed, which is a very noble cause. And uh, John's also an author and a speaker. And what we're going to talk about today, and this is very intriguing, is John contends that the age of information has ended. Yes. And, what, and what does that mean to you? So what does that mean to all of us? So, so John, the age of information has ended. Yes. Well, it's funny. We, we read about this kind of stuff, you know, in history books, right? That there was like, mm -hmm. you know, there was a stone age and a bronze yeah. age. And, you know, that sounds, it's like, yeah, 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 of course, technology changes, the world changes, but of course we're enlightened. Right. And so we live in the final age. It's sort of like this subconscious belief we all have that, oh, yeah. um, this idea of that, you know, we're only a couple of years away from self-driving cars and flying cars are right behind them. So we're basically living in the future. Yeah. But the reality is, um, I'm not alone in this. The World Economic Forum declared this last year in 2020, and they said the age of information has ended, uh, and we're going into a new age. Now, this was a shift that was already happening for a while, but it's really fascinating because just like the change from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age, we all have to go back and look at our tools and our systems and rethink everything. And I mean, and this and this is a shift that's already been going on. So once I explain it, it'll make sense. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really helpful to look at the world through this lens. The age of information was really, you know, began in the early 80s, where all of a sudden you, over a period of 20, 30 years, had increasing access to information across the globe, you know, through the rise of computers and internet and then social media. You know, gradually all the gatekeepers kind of died off that used to control information, you know. And so now if you're curious about something, anything, we you know, and you want to know the answer to pretty much any question on the planet. You can pull out the little supercomputer you keep in your pocket, hit a couple of buttons uh, or don't and just talk to it and find the answer to all your questions. So when that shift happened, we shifted into the age of information, the world changed dramatically because every, it, you know, every business, every culture had to, had to really just rethink our relationship with information. And so what's happened though, is that that was very exciting for a period of time, but for the last five or 10 years, for the most part, we're spending 90% of our energy ignoring information, right? Mm -hmm. Notifications, headlines, emails. There's too much information. We're drowning in it, right? I mean, how much yeah. data are we collecting on our own customers and our business that we just can't consume, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Does, this, yeah. does this sound familiar, and, John? Oh, yeah. And it's, and it's in many ways, it's making it the more information and the more access to information we have, the dumber it's making us. Yes. Right. Because we're like, we're just, we're just drowning in it. We're like, we, I know all the answers are there, but, but we're losing some of our ability. Well, as an aside, I would say some of that, some of that obsession with data has meant in sales and marketing, many people have really sure. just lost their ability to just practice empathy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in conversation. But what's this shift that is happening is basically that the shift has already, that already began about 10 years ago. You know, we've crossed the threshold really with the, all of the events of 2020, pushed us over the edge into what, what the World Economic Forum is calling the age of insight. Now, insight is different from information. Information is sort of like having access to the encyclopedia, right? Yeah. You've got literally like, well, it's sort of like Wikipedia, actually, which is like the ever-growing encyclopedia that's constantly changing yeah, and yeah, growing. It's probably, probably a good idea to use Wikipedia as the example because there's probably a lot of people who watch and listen to this podcast are going... Yeah, I've heard of an encyclopedia. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> That's true. just to just to educate you, educate you. Yes. Once upon a time, certainly when I was growing up, <laughs> we had an encyclopedia set, which was I don't know twenty different books on, and it covered every. And basically, if it wasn't in the encyclopedia, you didn't know anything about it. You didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and then, you, right. So, so the age of information changed that, of course. Um, and with Wikipedia and social media sites, you know, all the information's out there. But the difference between information and insight is, is curation through experience. And so stepping into this age of insight, now we as human beings are realizing we don't have the capacity emotionally, physically, time-wise to become the expert in everything. 
even though we have access to all the information. So we're looking for who is the person I trust on this topic? So who's the person I trust about my own personal nutrition? Who's the person I trust about where my kids should go to school or what curriculum they should follow? Who's the person I should trust about how to build my career? It's not about just having access to textbooks and blogs about those things. It's about identifying the trusted curators who then translate that. Instead of telling you 100 things you could do, they tell you the three things you need to do, the only three things, three things that really matter. And that's a huge shift, right? And it's and not that I'm saying this, you're going, oh, yeah, I guess that's true, right? I mean, I follow that one person on LinkedIn who gives me advice on how to like you know, structure my, my, my email pitches and you know, like we have this already, we're doing this, right? Maybe when you want to, uh, you know, you're thinking about switching doctors, you might text a couple local friends, right? And you find out like, hey, who do you recommend? I mean, I'm, I'm really just looking for insight. I want, I want to go straight to the best person for the for this yeah. need. Yeah. yeah, because I think I think uh, John, what you're saying here is basically yeah. the 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 current the currency of whatever age we're moving into now is definitely uh, trust and network. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And well, and actually, there's a second economic shift that um, just some different economists who won a Nobel Prize for it have identified that we've shifted into the attention economy. Whereas like, and this is where I'm, I'm really earning my nerd glasses with this reference, but, <laughs> you know, in, uh, in traditional economics, the idea is that a market is made up of supply and demand, right? Yep. Well, except for right now, supply for almost everything is almost infinite, right? Because you can 3D print it or you can copy paste it or you can stream it. And so whatever it is you're selling if you have enough demand, given the time and the money, you can create unlimited of pretty much anything. And so supply is almost a non-factor now in the economy. And it's all about who owns attention, who owns eyeballs. And it's the attention economy. That's why you have influencers and creators who online, who some of them, uh, some of them have no business being <laughs> massively influ- influential business leaders, they, but they have everyone's eyeballs. And so therefore, they're the true attention brokers, the power brokers of today's economy. Yeah, and ironically, uh, you know, the attention, the attention economy that they're calling here is happening mm-hmm. at the time when people's attention spans are shrinking, and mm-hmm. and people have gotten very superficial. So uh, I I agree with you. I mean, that that was always my big issue, John, with with this whole fascination with big data because it always sounded. Mm-hmm. I mean, it always just sounded, it sounded so grand, a big, big data. Anyway. And at the end of the day, it's not big data. It's small data that matters. It's data that's relevant mm. to you. I love that. That's a great way of looking at it. So, I mean, so when we're talking about like, to, you know, in business, business and sales, why this is important is that you need to basically just rethink your role as that it's not about getting people access to either information or resources, right? It's not about getting people access to the right information or to information in general or supplies in general, it's about getting them access to the specific information they want and the specific products they want, you know, and it's really tapping into that. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it, that's a, that's a mental shift. If you've been in business mm-hmm. for a few years or, you know, a decade or longer, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to change and shift. If you're new and new to this, then this is your opportunity just to rethink how you design your business, how you design your, your sales, your marketing and all that. Yeah, and there's an interesting shift as well, John. And we've noticed this ourselves. Is uh, mm-hmm. is that once upon a time, right? You would so if you had a need within your organization, you hire somebody for a role, okay? And you say, oh, I need somebody in marketing, so I'll hire a marketing generalist, and they can do all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. The trouble is nowadays that there's so many things are so specialized, like so so specific, that it no longer makes sense because you can hire somebody to do a specific task but you may not need them all the time. So therefore then you're having them do other things that they're not qualified to do. So this right. idea of using fractional resources, using contractors, using like Upwork and all these things and having this kind of hybrid organization where you, yeah, you have some full-time employees, but you also work with a lot of domain experts who are very, very mm. specific in what they do and they only work with you when needed. I love that. That's actually a really practical example of what the age of insight looks like. I think it's increased specialization within within a, within different fields where you're not just looking for a marketer, you're looking for a copywriter. You're not just looking for a copywriter, you're looking for an email copywriter. You know, and so you've got these like, you know, sub niches of each category where someone can go deep and there they can become the expert with the insight in that specific topic. And they can build a huge business doing that, you know because you can work with anyone in the world. I mean, it's sort of like just geography, just like supply is a non-factor here when you're talking about, you know, your team. So um, yeah, I think it's an exciting change and in the, in the long run, it's, it's better 
right? Because we're not looking at just drowning in data and we will probably have less of the, uh, you know, armchair philosophers on Facebook, you know, it, it becomes less important what your aunt Susie thinks about a specific topic. It becomes more important what the expert on that, on that subject thinks about that topic. Um, yeah. So to that end, to that end, then if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to stand out or you want to be one of those go-to people is you have to really establish yourself as a, as an expert in that area. Mm -hmm. You have to establish your trust and your credibility. Um, and that, that's, that's a, that's not a, uh, that's not a, an easy task really. No, no, it's not. But here's where, you know, we can kind of put data aside for a second. Well, you know, I, maybe that's not fair really to say put data aside, just that when we think of data, we usually think of like spreadsheets and algorithms. I put that aside for a second and remember that our brain is constantly analyzing data around us. What, what temperature it is when we're talking to someone, how their facial expressions move, uh, how their tone changes, all that kind of stuff. Just lean into that for a minute and just focus on your empathy advantage. And if you just take away all the fluff of algorithms and marketing campaigns and automations and sales funnels, the reality is that it's core business. And this is the, really the main, uh, this is the main thing I teach in my new book. Uh, at its core, business is creating a real solution to a real problem for real people. And so if you can get clear on who your real people are, right? We might say target customer or avatar, but I like to put away all that language for a second and just say your real people, human beings, who are the real people that you're, you're seeking to serve and then get to know them, whether that means mm. literally getting on a phone call or a zoom call or meeting up for a coffee or just studying them, become students of those real people. And what are the real problems in their life? And then that real solution, that's where the products come in. And that's how you stick out. I not try to create desire in someone by telling them, like, you need this thing that you're not looking for. No, find out what problems are already trying to solve and then just pair them with the solution to that problem. Um, that's how you stick out in an attention deficit economy, right? Where everyone's got this overwhelm and but that's the currency is attention. Yeah. And, and, uh, and on top of that too, if you think about it, if you think about the age of information and, uh, and it coincided obviously with the, with major technological advances, but mm -hmm. unfortunately a lot of those technologies were used to all, almost disconnect people, even though they were is, purportedly connecting everybody right we kept putting using technology to put to move people further and further away to make sure that we didn't have to really deal with them as humans and i think that was the big that was the big failure i think of mm -hmm. this of the information age i agree i think it's also a symptom of adapting because you got to remember that you know before the age of information and uh I guess I don't know off the top of my head what we called the last age before the age of information, but um, the Steve it was the Stone Age. I was alive. <laughs> it was the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went straight from Stone Age to. Yeah. Um, but you got to remember that before that, you know, there were key gatekeepers in every industry. So if you want to publish yeah. a book, you got to go through one of just a handful of publishers. If you want to uh, ship a product, you got to go through a you know a handful of you know distributors. There's you know, whatever it might be. There are all these gatekeepers. And so there's, there was all these layers between the consumer. I mean, you think like major record companies, major, yep. major record companies that sold millions of records had literally zero idea who actually bought them, right? Yep. Because it went through the distrib distributor, went to the local shop, someone bought it, you know, with it. And so that was kind of the world before the age of information. And so a lot of those businesses that adapted took that with them. They're just the assumption that we're just trying to kind of deal with the data in aggregate. But the reality is now, first of all, the gatekeepers are dead. You don't need them, right? At least their role has changed, right? A gatekeeper as a curator has whole value, but that's a whole other subject. Um, but the second thing is that we have that, we have the data that matters, which is the direct connection between a real human being who made a real decision and how that affects the, you know, them purchasing a product or a service and how that makes their life better and therefore makes the world a better place. And that's what's exciting. Um, that we really need to lean more into. Yeah, and I love I love that what you just said. That that's the you know we have that that's the real connection. You know that is that is where all of this comes together. And it's kind of almost like it's it's coming back full circle where now we're actually using the technology and using uh, all of these tools and, and things we have to almost recreate that personal interaction that maybe we used to have a long time ago. But a long time ago, it was very community, very location based. Mm -hmm. Now we've taken, we've taken away those constraints. Right. But that doesn't mean we've taken away our human need for connection. Right. And so we no. just have to rethink how we connect to people and how we, yeah. So 
Um, I mean, you hit on a minute ago with just kind of talking about how the data, you know, you, we just, we lose the humans in it, right? We talk about, you know, 10,000 sales or 10,000 followers or, 10, or even 2,000 customers. And that's why every time I refer to the, when I teach build, business building, every single time I come back to creating a real solution to a real problem for real people, because it's just that reminder, you just over and over again, we have to hear it that we're not, when we're looking at a spreadsheet full of email addresses, those are human beings with dreams and aspirations and health issues and a, you know, uh, you know, a mother-in-law they can't stand and, a, you know, a kid they're really worried about. I mean, these, these, these are human beings. And so, you know, business is, I love, I, you know, I view business as a way to really serve the world and serve people. I mean, like I view profit, for example, as a scorecard for how well I've served humanity. And so mm -hmm. that's my whole approach is that it's a humanitarian effort, you know, and so we got to remember the humans, you know, that's what this, we're all here for. Yeah, no, no, hundred percent, and I and I think it's great that we may be moving, we may be rediscovering that, and I think, uh, and I think if if anything, the the pandemic that we've been through has reinforced that uh, people mm -hmm. realizing that human connections, are, and maybe even that they need to step back for a moment and spend a little bit more time on the human element as opposed to you know just trying to run around like a headless chicken using technology as an enabler. Yes. You know, John, I wonder if it'd be helpful if I gave, just because we've talked about this idea of the agent yeah. insight, would it be helpful if I gave at least one kind of just practical, like nuts and bolts version of how to apply this to your business? Please. Okay. I think one of the things that I teach, you know, and, and we didn't really, we kind of mentioned it in passing, but this comes straight from my new book that, um, that's called Survive and Thrive, How to Build a Profitable Business in Any Economy, including this one. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, I, I teach that each business or whether you're, whether you're selling something of your own or selling someone that, of someone else's, you really need to want to focus on having three product offerings. Now there's a reason for the, this, which I think will make sense given our conversation about just how scarce people's attention is. There's a gateway product, a continuity product, and a flagship product. Now, starting at the top with the flagship product, you know, for this is the sort of like the big kahuna or the epitome of like the full transformation of everything you offer. Someone once asked me, you know, if a customer right now, right now wanted to buy from you, what is the most amount of money that you, that you would accept? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I expect, accept as much money. And they're like, no, 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 they can't talk to you. Right. If they can just go on your website or go to your store, what is the absolute most amount of transformation you will let them have? It's like, whoa. Okay. Well, when you think about it that way, yeah, that's your flagship product, right? The reality is your flagship product is it, probably the most expensive thing you offer. The vast majority of your customers may never buy it. I mean, maybe less than 10% will ever buy it. But the fact that it exists creates something to aspire to. And it also communicates a sort of manifesto to your customers or potential yeah. customers about what you stand for, right? So that's your flagship product. On the bottom, your gateway product is almost the exact opposite. It's designed to be a painless purchase, right? So everyone's inundated with thousands of advertisements, emails, social media messages, recommendations, and everyone's overwhelmed and tired and doesn't have a lot of attention. <laughs> And so if you get their attention enough for them to pause and say, wait a second, it sounds like you have a real solution to a real problem in my life. That is your chance to, to take that little bit of trust that you've earned and to, to reward it. Now, people at this point are not, most people are not going to jump straight to your flagship product. But if you can have a very clear gateway product, that's the first step. You, don't, you may not even make money on this, right? This may be a loss leader. You may lose money on it or break even on it, but this needs to be the low price product that you position and say, look, if you just want to give this a shot, here's where you should start. But the key here is to make sure that even though they're not putting out much of an investment, the reward they get is tenfold, right? And so you, it's a way to just take that trust and just 10 exit where you just blow them out of the water and, and they go, I want more of whatever you have to offer because you've, you've now earned my trust. Uh, the reason why I'm saying low price point and not giving a range is because it totally sure. depends on what industry you're in. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're a flagship product, if you're, if you're in a B2C industry and, you know, um, if you're going direct to consumer, you know, in a, you know, middle-class income, your flagship product may only be a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. which means your, yeah. your gateway product may only be $5 or less. But if you're in a business environment, it might be that your gateway products, $500 and your flagship products, $50,000. I and mean, so those, that really just depends on your target market, but the continuity is that third one. And that's just the glue that holds them together. So this is the subscription product, um, or this is the ongoing retainer. What it's, it's, it's designed to be the glue that holds those three together. You can have other products, but if you have to have those three to really present a picture that people can latch onto with scarce amount of attention and immediately understand how you can help them.
Yeah, and I like I like what you said about like the gateway product about uh, you know delivering outsized value because that's mm-hmm. not that's not the expectation that people have. So that's right. This gives you a great opportunity because if you buy the gateway or the low priced option, you're kind of conditioned to say, okay, it's probably going to be okay. I'm probably going to be missing a lot of things or whatever. Whatever, I'll give it yeah. a go. But if it delivers more than you're expecting, the chances of you going up to a higher level of product or the flagship product obviously mm-hmm. uh, is exponential because now you feel well wow if i got outside value from this what kind of value am i going to get from that exactly exactly that's exactly the idea and the point here is to remember the purpose of the gateway product because a lot of businesses make the mistake even if they have a sort of gateway product where they're like all right that's our cheap thing and so let's give them a cheap experience mm-hmm. because yeah you're not going to make a bunch of money off that one product but if you remember that the purpose of that gateway product is to give someone a chance who to who says, look, they say, I, they say, I trust you a little bit and I want to learn more. I mean, it, you know, you've probably heard this before. I often, you know, sales and marketing is compared to dating that it's sort of like it's sort of like the first date, you know, like you don't want to go too crazy and scare him away, but you don't want to have just a boring first date. And you're yeah. like, well, it's just the first date. So it's going to be boring. Actually, we're not going to do much. <laughs> You know, it's like, no, no, you want to really wow them. So they go on a second date with you. Um, yeah. yeah my, I, I will say I did. I may have set a record with my first date, my wife, with my wife, now wife, um, when we were just friends. Uh, I did. I did like a three course dinner on the roof. Maybe that's a little overboard, but hey, it worked. <laughs> but it's funny. Yeah. If you think about it, if you think about that, that is exactly that's a great analogy, because that's exactly how we do treat a lot of people with gateway products. It's just like, well. I don't know whether you're really going to be somebody worth investing in. So yeah. So rather than take you for dinner, I'll take you to, we'll go for coffee and we'll just see how it goes. And maybe you can earn your way to dinner. Who knows? <laughs> right. Or maybe you just go through the McDonald's drive through You're like, you know, Hey, yeah. let's just drive around for like 15 minutes, go through the McDonald's <laughs> drive through just see like, if there's a second date, then yeah, I'll start adding value. But right now let's just, you know, I'm not sure if there's going to be a second date. Exactly. Well, there definitely is not going to be a second date then <laughs> with, yeah, yeah. with that attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Unless you meet somebody who loves McDonald's and then. Uh, that's true. That's true. I'm not trying trend. to. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, hey, listen, John, this has been fantastic. This, all of John's information is going to be below this video, but please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Oh, I'd be happy to. So I've got a new book that just came out. And so it's called mm-hmm. Survive and Thrive, How to Build a Profitable Business in Any Economy, including this one. You can get a copy by going to surviveandthrivebook.com. There's also some bonuses that go with that that, I, that are free, that I'm giving away, that I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, by the way, this book is my gateway product. So you'll have to <laughs> test me on whether or not I blow your expectations out of the water after you uh, get a copy of the book. But I wrote this book in response to the economic crisis of 2020. I really, this is my way to be part of the solution. Um, and so it's been, some reviewers have called it a weekend MBA, which is a great thing. Uh, right. I think that's really cool. So I hope that it helps you build or rebuild, um, a really thriving business that makes the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, uh, the book, the link to the book and everything will be below the video. And I would absolutely encourage you to check it out. As you can see, uh, you know, John's got a lot of wisdom to, to share and, you know, get yourself, you. yeah tool yourself up for the for the changes that are already underway because let's face it i mean the point you said that this trend probably or this new era maybe started like five years ago probably a lot of people haven't really right. noticed it yet because you know sometimes it takes a while so you can get ahead here's your chance to get ahead yeah you could be that guy who you know 10 years into the bronze age is still using a stone chisel and everyone's shaking their head or you could yeah, exactly. you could be on you could be the one walking around town saying check out this bronze <laughs> chisel I've got right here. You can be on the front end of it, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I do remember when bronze came in. That was awesome. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right. Listen, my name is John Golden. Thank you very much, John Meese, and I will see you all for another interview very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work.